Hi, I'm Jason Howland. Welcome to Speaking of Health, a place to help you learn how to live a longer and healthier life. Drinking a glass of milk, enjoying a fried egg, or eating a peanut butter sandwich, all things that most of us take for granted, but not someone with a food allergy to one or all of those foods. Food allergies are often misunderstood by the public, but make no mistake, a severe allergic reaction can be deadly. Our guest today is Dr. Kunal Shah. She is a Mayo Clinic Health System allergist. Dr. Shah, thanks for joining us today. Thanks for having me. Well, we are talking today about food allergies. Let's start off by talking about what exactly is a food allergy and what causes food allergies. So food allergies are when your immune system takes a food and a protein in it and, and considers it foreign or threatening. Our immune systems are there to fight anything that threatens us, bacteria or toxins. But in this situation, it takes something that should be natural, but instead it perceives it as foreign. And what it does is it tells its own cells to make immunoglobulin or antibodies, and it's called immunoglobulin E or IgE, to that food. Those that act as antennas, they attach to cells in your lungs, in your um, GI system, as well as on your skin. And then when that food protein comes by again, it perceives it, it sends a signal to those cells to create all the symptoms associated with food allergies to try to get rid of that, that threat. So really it all boils down to your body is misunderstanding something. Exactly. Hmm. Um, so how common are food allergies? Are they very common? Food allergies are common, but not as common as everybody thinks. A true food allergy in children, less than three, was found in about, in about six to eight percent of children. But when you get to adults, you find about three percent of adults have food allergies. And this is because many food um, allergies can be outgrown, although you, you're never able to be cured, but you can be outgrown. Uh, food allergies really aren't as common as some um, people might think. What are some of the most common food allergens, things that people are actually allergic to? So the top allergens for food are milk, soy, wheat, eggs, shellfish, and regular fish, as well as peanuts and tree nuts. So, and what are some of the symptoms, if you're allergic to a food, uh, what are symptoms of an allergic reaction? So we had kind of talked about those, those immunoglobulin E being on the skin, the gut, and the lungs. So when they send that, that signal that to their cells when they see the food, it releases histamine histamine and other chemicals. What that causes is swelling of the lips, eyelids, tongue, throat, itching of the skin, hives on the skin, wheezing, cough, shortness of breath, as well as vomiting, diarrhea, and nausea. It can get um, so severe actually that you can have dizziness and loss of consciousness as well. Mm -hmm. Doesn't sound very fun no. <laughs> at all. So uh, what about anaphylaxis? What is that? I've heard of that. So anaphylaxis is a fancy way of saying severe life-threatening allergic reaction. So that's when you have multiple of those systems involved, um, especially when you get to the point where the swelling in the throat is so bad that you can't breathe and your airway is cut off, or to the point where you're so dizzy um, and your blood pressure drops and you pass out. So that's what we call anaphylaxis. And if someone uh, is having an anaphylaxis reaction to a food, is it something that they can um, just wait it out or should they go to the ER right away? So if you have anaphylaxis, the only way to be saved is to be injected with epinephrine. People who know they have a food allergy carry um, inject injectable epinephrine on them. Mm -hmm. If you don't and it's a first reaction, um, immediately you need to call 911 because the am ambulance service at least has it um, or go to the ER. So uh, what's the difference between a food allergy and a food intolerance? Because I've heard of people being uh, lactose intolerant, for example. Does that mean that they're allergic to milk? Is that another way of saying it, or is it something else? It's, uh, Jason, this is a great point, and this is where people get so confused and think they have a food allergy. So food intolerance involves your digestive system, not your immune system. And what it is is that somewhere in your digestive system you cannot properly break down or digest certain foods. The example of milk is great. That's when you don't have enough um, milk, enzy uh, milk sugar enzymes. So you can't break down the milk sugars. Or in celiac disease or gluten intolerance, your body can't digest um, wheat-based products or certain grain-based products that have gluten and, it's, and it sits in the gut as a toxic byproduct and can cause symptoms such as bloating, um, abdominal pain, 
just like lactose intolerance causes abdominal pain, some people get diarrhea and vomiting, but those symptoms are all isolated to your GI system. They don't usually involve skin, they don't involve swelling, they're not life-threatening. And the difference with the intolerance is you end up developing an intolerance as you grow older or with extended exposure to a certain food, but not the first time you have it, not with the smallest amount, and it's not as severe as an allergy. And is it also gradual compared to uh, an allergic reaction most of the times? fairly immediate, right? Exactly. It is. It's gradual. Sometimes people develop um, their symptoms of an intolerance hours to days after having eaten that food. So, so just so we're clear, celiac disease, lactose intolerant, not food allergies at all. Exactly. Great. So, so how do you go about testing someone for a food allergy? So when they first come to an allergist, we get a good clinical history. We want to find out what food they ate, what combinations of food they had been eating, how often they've had that food, what kind of symptoms have they developed, and what was the timeline between when they first had the food and developed the symptoms. Then we go on uh, to do a testing. Testing usually involves a skin test where we take um, an extract, which is the isolated protein from the food. We place it on the skin using a plastic pricker that barely scratches your skin. Within 15 minutes, if you see a mosquito bite at that site, then you have a positive. We know that you have IgE or immunoglobulin E to that food. Alternatively, we use a blood test. In the blood test, we look for specific IgE to the food that you're allergic to. And that tells us that you have high levels of circulating in your blood, IgE, which means you're allergic. You can have other um, levels called IgG, but those don't reflect an allergy. So you have to be very specific in what kind of testing you get and how to interpret it. Next, if we still aren't completely sure, we move on to a food challenge. A food challenge is a great way to both diagnose an allergy as well as to see if you're outgrowing it or becoming tolerant to the food. Food challenges are when you're um, in a doctor's office because you want a controlled setting, but you're given small amounts of the food on a gradual basis, all while being monitored. And if you can tolerate that food and don't develop symptoms, you're not allergic. But if you develop symptoms, we treat it right away in the office, and we can say with 100% that that is your allergy. Because unfortunately, the testing for food allergies is not very specific or sensitive. You can have a positive but not be allergic to a food, and have a negative and actually be allergic to a food. And where this gets us into trouble is we don't want to tell anyone, um, especially children, not to eat a certain food when we're not completely sure. So really, it sounds like the food challenge is probably one of the best ways for you as an allergist to properly diagnose someone uh, that they truly do have a food allergy because you can see it right, right. there firsthand. Um, in our community, that's the gold standard for, t for food allergy testing. So when someone has been diagnosed with a food allergy, how do you go about treating it or can you treat it? Can you cure it? Unfortunately, right now there's no cure. There is some research on, on various modalities that may help induce tolerance, but there's no cure. The way to treat it is um, education. We spend a lot of time in our office talking about how to read food labels, how to eat out, where to eat out, what questions to ask if you're eating a food that you yourself haven't prepared. Because it's difficult. You still want to maintain your same quality of life. You want to go out. You want to be at family members' homes and friends' homes, but you really have to know what questions to ask because sometimes it's not very obvious if, you're al if your food allergen is in the food you've eaten. Wearing a medical alert bracelet helps. We teach people to carry antihistamines and, epi and injectable epinephrine. We teach them how to use it, and we often train family members on how to use it too so that if you're in trouble, someone else can help you out. How about uh, medications? So like when someone has hay fever, uh, they can get um, prescription medications like Allegro or they can get over-the-counter things like, uh, you know, Sudafed, Benadryl, those kind of things. Do, th do you use those things when you have a food allergy or is it totally different? So there are some cases where it's a very mild allergy, um, just the skin is involved or you, you think you may have gotten exposed to something. Sometimes people will use something uh, like an antihistamine such as Benadryl um, for a mild reaction. But we never recommend eating, taking the antihistamine and then eating the food you're allergic to in the hopes that you won't react because in the long term you can make yourself worse or have the allergy persist for longer. What about uh, uh, not eating foods but uh, just coming in contact, touching food or breathing in um, uh, some of the, I guess, p particles that are in the air from the mm -hmm. food? Uh, is that also an issue for people that have food allergies? Certain people, if they also have asthma, um, and usually it's moderate to severe asthma, can 
get it, uh, that can be their trigger. So they can have an asthma flare when they've inhaled that food protein. Mm -hmm. Usually you need a lot of um, exposure by skin or by inhaling to develop the reactions of a food allergy. Um, but when you ingest it, the smallest amount should set you off. So it is something that occurs. It's something that causes a lot of anxiety in, in people, um, patients of ours, family. Mm -hmm. But usually, unless you have severe asthma, that, that's not the case. The best thing is just try to be as safe as you can. Avoid exposure as best as you can. Uh, what about, um, I've heard of uh, people that are allergic to uh, fruits and vegetables, uh, but only when they're raw, not when they've been cooked. What, what exactly is that? Yeah, that's a really interesting phenomena. It's called pollen food allergy or oral allergy syndrome. And what happens is, um, a good example would be apples, the part closest to the peel. The protein there looks a lot like birch tree pollen. So when you eat the raw apple, your body thinks you've eaten a fistful of pollen and it sets off this immediate reaction, itching, burning in your mouth. A lot of kids will spit out certain vegetables um, or fruits. But when it's cooked, the proteins unfold and they no longer look like birch tree pollen. So apple pie, apple sauce, cause no symptoms. So it's not necessarily you're allergic to that food. It's the body uh, um, is mistaking that raw fruit for a, a pollen allergy that you already have. Exactly. Right? So if you treat the pollen allergy, that usually goes away, that sensation that you get with the certain mm -hmm. foods, because we call it cross-reactivity. They sort of react to both. Now what about um, for folks that I'm, I'm thinking of uh, foods such as milk or eggs, really common foods when it comes to cooking. Um, you know, anything you bake pretty much has eggs or milk in it. Um, for folks that are allergic to milk or eggs, can they not eat those, those types of foods then? Anything that's been cooked with even a small amount of say one egg or a small amount of milk? So and that's a great place where an allergist can help you because it all depends on the level of your allergy. A lot of times we pick up kids' allergies because of their birthday cake. They ha that was their first exposure to egg and that's where they reacted, even with that very extensively cooked egg. Mm -hmm. However, as you get older and you're outgrowing the allergy or if you have a mild allergy, we can test you and we can then do a challenge to what we call um, baked egg or baked milk. And once that egg or milk is extensively heated, if your allergies are on the milder end, you can tolerate that. Mm -hmm. And we can do a challenge, again in the office, in a controlled setting, using a little bit at a time. But if we find that you can eat that, then you go on eating baked eggs and baked milk. The research shows that you will become tolerant or outgrow that allergy sooner than if you let nature take its course. The nice part with that also is you don't have to be as strict about label reading because you know, or, or asking questions because you know they can tolerate that, that mm -hmm. little amount when it's extensively heated. But certainly folks that have those severe allergic reactions to uh, egg or milk, uh, they have to really watch everything that's cooked to make sure that those items aren't in there. Even though it's cooked, it's a small amount. Um, the, Exactly. Folks with, with severe reactions, they have to really watch out then, don't they? Exactly. If you're a severe reactor, if your levels of IgE to that food are very high, you will react even if it's extensively heated, even if you eat the smallest amount. So those patients have to be very careful. They have to question everything they eat or just eat stuff that they feel safe um, or that they've made at home themselves. So uh, any last words of advice for folks? Um, uh, if maybe they suspect they have a food allergy, they think maybe they had some sort of reaction to, to eating a type of food or touching a type of food, what should they do? The best bet is to see an allergist. An allergist is actually going to help find out whether you're truly allergic to or not. Do you really need to avoid this food or carry the epinephrine? If you do, they'll train you on how to avoid the food, how to take the medication if, if you have a severe reaction. But on the flip side, they may do a challenge and find you're not allergic to it, which would really make life easier because then you don't have to avoid that food anymore. They also can help explain that you might be having a food intolerance, but not a food allergy. That actually at least helps with peace of mind and anxiety, knowing that you're not going to have a systemic life-threatening reaction to that food. Great. Well, unfortunately, we're all out of time, but I'd like to thank our guest today, Dr. Kunal Shah, uh, allergist with Mayo Clinic Health System. Thanks for joining us today on Speaking of Health. Thank you. Have a great day, everyone, and be healthy.